Good morning, South Brisbane Church, and welcome to worship this Sabbath. Except that on the, when we're recording this, it's, it's Wednesday at morning in Tui Forest Park. If you ever want to go for a, a walk with the family, Sabbath afternoon or on Sunday or sometime, Tui Forest Park between uh, Maruka and Tarragindi is, is a beautiful place. Welcome to Tui Forest Park and welcome to worship today at South Brisbane Church. We've got an interesting program, a slightly different program prepared at, at short notice. And uh, the Lord has, has inspired Ashley and myself to, to choose a, a video by Jeff Yulden that was at the, uh, um, <coughs> from one of his talks at the recent uh, Grey Nomads uh, camp down in New South Wales. I've been thinking this week about one of Jesus' important sayings in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Just think, pure heart built with the ability to see God. If we could get rid of all the rubbish or that affects us from the world and we could have a pure heart, we will see God. Wouldn't you like that? May the Lord bless us as we worship Him today. can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, his child and forever I am. His love is the theme of my song. His love is the theme of my song. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, His child and forever. friends. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, what a marvellous experience it is, even despite all the challenges of the, the times in which we live. We have grace to, uh, to worship you freely, 
to pray to you freely, to read your word freely, to uh, reflect on your goodness and, and mercy towards us. Thank you for these wonderful experiences of life and may we commit to you each day the, the rest of our lives and <clears throat> be sensitive to the working of your spirit in our lives. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful place here. We thank you for the, for the uh, birds and the, and the living plants, many different varied things, and we thank you for the rocks which remind us of your you being the rock of our salvation. Lord, we, we want you to be part of our worship today, even though we're in our own homes, and uh, we pray for your presence in our family lives, in our uh, church life, and in our life of looking forward in hope for the soon coming of Jesus. Father, today we pray a family is the Safo family. They've come to us from Ghana. There's Daniel and Esther, who are both lovely Christian people who are looking forward to your coming back. They have busy lives. They have three children. They have their active boy twins, Sammy and Emmanuel, and their little daughter, Akua. Lord, we just pray a special blessing on them this week. You know the challenges that they face. We ask, Lord, that you'll give them health and strength and wisdom and love, and your angels will protect them from any harmful, evil influences that might be there to trip them up in their walk with you. Lord, we bear them up before you, as we do with all our families, our young families and each of us. We ask, Lord, that you'll keep us looking to you, keep us close to your heart of love. May we learn to encourage and help each other in our walk with you, we pray. Lord, thank you that we can pray together. It's, it, it is surely a, a beautiful experience. And we pray that uh, you guide us as we reflect on truth, as we reflect on grace, as we uh, worship you this Sabbath morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi girls and boys, how are you today? Can you see what I have here? It's a nice fluffy toy and I thought I would share this with you today because I really love this fluffy toy. It's so really nice and fluffy and cuddly. I just love it. What else can I share for me with you? Let me have a little look here. Oh, look here. I have a lovely book that I can share. This book is all about people in the Old Testament. That's a good thing to share because there's lots of good stories about Jesus. What else can I share? I can share a game. Do you like playing games? When I play games, I like to play games with friends. So that means I'm sharing my games with friends. What do I have here? Look, I have a pear, an apple, banana, and some yummy nuts, lots and lots of things I can share with other people. And what is this? Oh, it's a $50 note. How can I share that? Well, do you know, I could share that with somebody who has as little and doesn't have as much money to buy food or clothes, or maybe I could give it um, to Jesus to help other people learn about Jesus. Well, do you know what? I want to ask you about sharing and how important it is. But have you ever thought about sharing Jesus? Well, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about sharing Jesus. But first, tell me, is there anybody that you would like to meet? Somebody really, really important, like the Queen or the Prime Minister or who else, maybe a famous um, sports person. So if one of those people come into your room right now, would you be excited? 
I'm sure you would be excited. And I'm sure if it happened to me, the first thing I would want to do would be to run and tell everybody. Well, do you know that's what happened in the Bible times? That's what happened when Jesus came to earth. There was a man and his name was John the Baptist. And he learned about Jesus and he learned to love Jesus and he was so excited about knowing about Jesus. And do you know, John baptized Jesus. But John was so excited, he didn't want to keep it all to himself. No, he wanted to tell everybody. And that's just what he did. John would go and tell everybody about Jesus. And those people would follow Jesus and they would listen to Jesus and Jesus would tell them many, many things. He told them all about heaven and he told them how to be kind and loving. And Jesus also told them that one day he would die on the cross. And that was really sad. But the good thing was, exciting, was Jesus said that he would rise again and he would go to heaven. And when he went to heaven, he would get a place ready for you and me and all the people who love Jesus to go up and live with him. Oh, won't that be exciting to do that sort of thing, to go to heaven and live with Jesus? But do you know what? All those people that followed Jesus, they were so excited, they thought we must tell other people as well. And that's what they did, just like John. They went out and they told people about Jesus, how there's Jesus who come to forgive them for all the wrong things they did. And Jesus was going to go to heaven and get a place for them and say that if we choose to love Jesus, we could go to heaven and live with Jesus. That is so exciting, isn't it? And do you know what? The more people we tell about Jesus, the more people, other people will hear about Jesus because they will go and tell Jesus too. Isn't that exciting? So what about you? You're not real big. You're not as big as me or as old as me. But can you share your love of Jesus? Just like you do with your toys and all those sort of things. That's really good. But sharing Jesus is something very, very special. How can you do that? Well, I thought about this. How can all the smaller people share Jesus? And Jesus told us what to do. Do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, love everybody, to love everybody. And we can talk to people about Jesus. So we can talk to our family, our friends. We can do that. That's sharing Jesus. But what about the things we do? What about when we're playing with our friends? What about our families? Can we share with Jesus them, with them by our actions? Our actions show other people that we love Jesus and that we love them because that's what Jesus said. Jesus said to love other people. And do you know what we can do to share Jesus? We can be happy and we can smile all the time. Even when we are sad, it's very difficult, but we can know that Jesus will help us still to share him and be happy. Oh, that, is, that is so special. When we show other people that we care about them and we care about what happens to them, we know that that is what Jesus wants us to do. So sharing is caring. And do you know what? Many people will learn to know about Jesus by the things you do, the things you share. So girls and boys, I want you to think about that. But right now, I want you to have a prayer with me so we can ask Jesus to help us to share his love with other people. So do you want to have a little prayer with me? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the love of Jesus. Help us to remember the great news of his death and resurrection. Help us to share the good news with others. Thank you we can be disciples. Thank you for your love. We love you, God. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Thank you, girls and boys, for listening so nicely. And you have a really happy day. And remember, don't forget to share Jesus. That is really important. Bye now. important that we strengthen what we believe in and I believe the the sanctuary is so important that it validates the whole of the advent message the whole of it all right well let's come over let's do a little bit of, of a review from yesterday just a little Leviticus chapter 4 just come back to Leviticus chapter 4 Genesis Exodus Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 4 it says he shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the lord lay his hand on the bull's head and kill the bull before the lord now we have studied enough for us to know that when the animal was slain, blood was taken of that animal and was sprinkled into the sanctuary. And it did vary depending upon who sinned and what was done as to exactly how it was manipulated, if I can use that word, in the sanctuary. Sometimes it was sprinkled on the horns of the altar. Sometimes it was eaten by the priest therefore transferring the sin to the priest, who then would transfer it to the sanctuary. Other times the blood was taken into the uh, holy place. As I said, it depended upon who sinned. But in all cases, what was happening was that sin was being transferred from the individual to the sanctuary. In, in, it, in its essence, that's what was happening. Leviticus chapter 10, if you wouldn't mind just coming over to the 10th chapter. Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 17. Why have you not eaten? This is um, God speaking to Aaron's sons. Why have you not eaten the sin offering in the holy place? Since it is most holy and God has given it to you to bear the guilt of the congregation and to make atonement for them before the Lord. See, its blood was not brought inside the holy place. Indeed, you should have eaten it in a holy place as I commanded. So basically what happened was when the person who sinned came along, the animal's life was taken and the person confessed their sin over the head of the animal, thus in type transferring the sin from the individual to the animal. Then the blood, as I said, was sprinkled somehow into the sanctuaries. It varied, but it was transferred onto the sanctuary. Thus in type, transferring the sin from the individual to the sanctuary. And that went on day after day after day. And then on the Day of Atonement, a special service took place whereby all the sin that had accumulated in the sanctuary over the last 12 months was then taken from the sanctuary and placed on the head of a goat. And we'll come to that in just uh, a moment. And therefore, the sanctuary was cleansed of all the accumulation of sin that had taken place over the 12 months. Does that make sense? Yes, I think basically we have a pretty fair idea about that. And uh, so the sanctuary itself needed to be cleansed. Now, if you come over to the 16th chapter of um, Leviticus, this is the chapter that deals in much detail about the Day of Atonement. 
chapter 16 and verse 16. If you want to read and study the Day of Atonement, this is the chapter that you would go to. It says, so he shall make atonement for the holy place. This is talking about the priest. Because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins, and so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Now, I've put on the screen here um, some of the high points of Leviticus 16. And I'll just, we'll just read them down because I haven't got time to read the whole chapter now. But the first thing you read about is the high priest offers the daily morning sacrifice. This is before the ritual of the Day of Atonement started. The first thing the priest would do, the high priest would do, is he offered the daily sacrifice or morning sacrifice himself. So after the service, the special Day of Atonement uh, took place as we read in Leviticus 16. Aaron told, was told not to come into the most holy place lest you die. Verse 4 tells us on the Day of Atonement he had to wear special clothing. As the service begins, the high priest receives from the congregation two goats for a sin offering or a ram for a burnt offering and a bullock for his own offering. You can see it's quite detailed. Before any blood could be administered, he is to offer incense which covers the mercy seat. Sorry for the spelling of that. Um, before the bullock is killed, lots are cast over two goats, one for the Lord and the other as the scapegoat. The Lord's goat is offered as a sin offering. The other goat is not killed but has the sins from the sanctuary placed upon him but not as a sin bearer. It's very important. The Bible stresses this goat, that is, the goat that is not killed or the scapegoat, this, the Bible stresses this goat is not a sacrifice as it is not killed. Now, the reason we need to stress that is because our evangelical friends believe that both goats represent Jesus. And you need to be aware of that. So that's why I'm stressing what the Bible stresses here, that this goat was not killed. So it was never a sacrifice. The sins of those who are redeemed by the blood of Christ will at last be rolled back upon the originator of sin and must bear their punishment. So the Bible teaches that uh, someone has to bear the final responsibility, the one who caused everybody to sin, the one who caused Jesus to to have to die. He has to bear final responsibility for uh, all the terrible things that he has done in the world. And remember that the Bible is telling us that this service is a pattern. The reason the sanctuary purpose, uh, service has been given to us is as a pattern to help our simple minds understand the plan of salvation. And it helped the people back in the Old Testament who hadn't seen the fact that Jesus was going to die or didn't understand all of that, but they did understand a little about it because of the sanctuary. And it's wonderful for us to be able to study it because it helps us to understand the details. And the best way to understand the plan of salvation is by studying the sanctuary. Now, the sanctuary needed cleansing. Because this is a ritual. We're, we're talking about a ritual that God developed so that he would help us to understand how sin was finally going to be dealt with. And at the same time, as we noticed yesterday, God has to be seen to be just as well as justifying us. Get the idea? And he has to do that before the whole universe. So the whole thing has got to be done out in the open so that everybody in the universe, including us as human beings, can understand it. And that's why it might seem a little bit involved, but uh, 
if we study it very clearly, it'll come to our minds. There's a wonderful chapter, for example, in Great Controversy on the sanctuary. Patriarchs and Prophets. If you read those chapters for a start, it'll give you a good start and a good understanding. So the sanctuary needed to be cleansed because of all the sins that were transferred via the animal and the blood into the sanctuary for the whole 12 months. And just as with the individual involved the transfer of sin from the individual, so the sanctuary needed to have the, the transfer of the record of confessed sins out of the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. It had to be cleansed too. And on the Day of Atonement, blood was brought into the most holy place. And the animal, the goat was slain, and that goat was not, uh, sin wasn't confessed over that goat. This is the Lord's goat now I'm talking about. Sin wasn't, that, uh, that uh, is not a goat that was slain and confessed sins were placed upon it because it represented the fact that Jesus was dying for us and his clean blood, if I could use, uh, sometimes we look for illustrations all the time on, on, so that we can visualize this thing. The best I can come up with at the moment is like a magnet. You know, you put a magnet in and what does it do? All the metal brings it into it. Now, this is if I could use that as an illustration of the Lord's goat blood, it brings all the confessed sins that it accumulated and it was made to atone for that. Let's have a look now at chapter 16 and this time verse 19. It says, Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. So um, that's fairly clear. I think the Bible, we don't need to explain that too much because I think it's very uh, straightforward. Now, when we take up the New Testament over in the book of Hebrews, we find that Paul now takes that imagery that we have been reading about what happened in the old sanctuary and applies it to what Jesus is doing. So come over to the book of Hebrews now, and this is when it becomes very, very important for us to understand. Hebrews chapter 8. And once again, we would never have known this if it hadn't been for the sanctuary. That's why most of our good friends in our evangelical churches know precious little about this. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, it says, talking of, the, of Christ, it says, of the priests in the Old Testament, who serve the copy and shadow of what? Heavenly things. So the, the Old Testament sanctuary was there as a pattern of what? Of the heavenly. Now, it's interesting that the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Catholic Church is the antitype of the sanctuary. Did you know that? That's what they believe. That's why they have priests, that's why they have incense, that's why they have all the trappings of the Old Testament sanctuary because they believe that they are the fulfillment of the Old Testament sanctuary. You get the idea? And, and that's exactly what Daniel chapter 8 says that they would do. They would literally cast down to the earth the sanctuary and the truth so that instead of Catholics understanding what Jesus is doing in heaven, which they don't, they look to an earthly priesthood 
an earthly mass instead of a heavenly one. Get the idea? But the Bible here clearly teaches that these priests in the Old Testament serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So God gave to Moses a pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. That's why it's important to study the pattern because we get a very clear picture then of what's going on in heaven in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, if you come over to Hebrews 9, the next chapter, and verse 23, it adds a little bit more on this point where it says in verse 23, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So does the heavenly sanctuary need to be cleansed? What do we read? Let's read it again. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So the earthly cleansing was a copy of the heavenly. All right, that's what Paul is saying here in Hebrews. Now, you remember, in fact, we ought to turn this up. Just come over to, um, to the book of Peter, First Peter, which is a couple of pages after um, Hebrews, and then James and then Hebrews, uh, uh, Peter, sorry. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Notice the language now that's used. If you don't understand the sanctuary, then this language is not as clear as it is when you understand the sanctuary because it says in verse 24, talking of Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Now the first part of this verse says, who himself bore our sins in his body. So our sins are transferred to where? To Christ. He bears our sin like the priests did in the Old Testament into the sanctuary. And Jesus bears our sins in his body as he goes into the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, and uh, as I said, Peter is making reference to uh, that experience. And uh, the Bible is saying here that Jesus bore our sins in his body. And just as the earthly priest was an intercessor on earth for Israel and involved taking the sins into the sanctuary and placing them there, Jesus is our intercessor in heaven, bearing our sins in his body so to speak, as he takes them into the heavenly sanctuary. Have a look at Hebrews 8. Just come back a few pages again to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2 says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. So when we confess our sins, our sins are removed from us. And in the record books of heaven is written, forgiven. Because when are our, our sins recorded? When you confess them? When are they written in the books? When they're committed. They lie there until they are confessed. And as soon as you confess your sins, it is written in those books, forgiven. 
forgiven. And we were discussing this the other day when we talked about the investigative judgment, you'll remember. And just as in the Old Testament, sins were confessed and taken from the individual to the sanctuary, the same is exactly true in the New Testament. Only Jesus bears us. His sacrifice, once for all. We'll read that. If you come over to Hebrews 9 and verse 28, look at this. Hebrews 9. And when we look at this, it just helps us to understand what's going on and keeps us from being diverted. Hebrews 9 verse 28, it says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. All right. What does that mean, apart from sin? We understand the first part. He died once for us. But the second time he's going to come back, he comes back apart from sin. What does that mean? Yes, he's dealt with sin. When he comes back the second time, he's not going to deal with sin, is he? No, it's been dealt with. That's the whole work of him in the, in the heavenly sanctuary. Apart from sin when he comes back the second time, let, let me just read you um, the clear word. It says, so Christ had to die once to take away our sins. We're clear on that. He will not come back to bear them for us a second time or to give us still another chance, but he will come back to destroy sin and to save those who are waiting for him. Is that a good, that's a good translation, I think. Yes, makes it clear. Not that the New King James isn't, isn't good. It's a good translation. But sometimes to read, that's why we shouldn't be, I think, so narrow-minded that we never read a modern translation. Sometimes I meet people who think that there's only one translation, and that's the old King James. And, and I tell you, all my memory is old King James. Whenever I try to memorize verses, I, I, I get the old King James because that's what I was, you know, I read and read and read and read. But we need not to be so narrow-minded that we can't help to, us to understand exactly what's being said. And the modern translations can be helpful. They can be also not helpful, but you, we've got to work out. And this one, I think, is particularly uh, helpful on this. Now... Here's a question. Why does God go through this elaborate program? It's pretty elaborate, isn't it? When you think of it, taking up all the chapter after chapter after chapter in the Bible, there's got to be some reason. Why does he go through all this? I mean, he could have eradicated sin instantly, couldn't he? If he chose to. But he didn't. He purposely went through all this, what might we call, program? Audiovisual, yes, good. That's a good word, yes. Because God needed to show the universe. Remember, the purpose of Jesus primarily coming to this earth was for what reason? Why? What's the f- most important reason Jesus came to, to this earth to die? To God so loved the world. Hmm? So yes, he did. There's no question about that. Remember, to vindicate the character of God. That's the most important thing. And, and as we said yesterday, we are so glad that in doing that, he can save you and me. And, and that, those verses, and there are lots, lots more that we can read, that uh, buttress his love for us. No question about that. But we must never lose sight of the fact that there's a bigger issue going on than just only saving us. God wants us to be saved. Of course he does. But he also wants to use us to help to vindicate his character. That's what we were studying yesterday. 
And we want to read that verse again because it's important. So we must never forget that it was the sins of Israel that defiled the sanctuary. And every morning and every evening, that program went on. Now, here's another question that we can think about that's important. In the service on the Day of Atonement, it was to cleanse both the sanctuary and the priesthood and the people of their sins. All right? Three things. The sanctuary, the priesthood, and the people. Now, here's the question. Why did the people need to be cleansed on the Day of Atonement? Because weren't they forgiven when they confessed their sins? Yeah. Well, why then did the, does the Bible say they need to be cleansed on the Day of Atonement? Because the Bible teaches that. And we all recognize that when they confess their sins, their sin was removed from them to the animal, to the sanctuary. Well, why? Let me read you Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. And this will throw a little light on it, I hope. Revelation, the 20th chapter, talking of the millennium. Chapter 20 and verse 12 says, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now, were their books kept in the earthly sanctuary? Do you remember reading about the books in the earthly sanctuary? No, there weren't any. But there was a record kept. How was the record kept in the Old Testament sanctuary? Through the blood, correct. The blood recorded confessed sins, isn't that right? And uh, that went on, as we, uh, as we have noticed, for the whole year. And every day the blood was sprinkled. It was recording Sins confessed. Every drop of blood did that. And on the Day of Atonement, that was then removed from the sanctuary that had accumulated, so to speak, over the 12 months. So the sanctuary needed to be cleansed of all the accumulated sins over the last year. So the blotting out of sin... And the removal of the record of sins was the final act in the Day of Atonement ritual. Let me just say that again. The blotting out of sin and the removal of sin from the record books was the final act in the work of the Day of Atonement. Because remember, when the sin was placed on the head of the goat, the goat was led out and let go because the goat is bearing responsibility for bringing all the sin into the world, of causing the death of Jesus, of making you sin and making me sin and millions and millions of others. Someone has to bear that responsibility, not as a sacrifice. Jesus bears that as a sacrifice, but as bearing responsibility. And that's what our evangelical friends don't quite understand so on the day of atonement there were two cleansings there was the cleansing of the sanctuary and the cleansing of the people let me read that come back to Leviticus and uh, then we'll look at the fulfillment in the New Testament Leviticus chapter 16 Genesis Exodus Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 30 says, for on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to, to what? Cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So was there a cleansing on the day of atonement for the individuals? Was there? Yes, we just read it. And yet they had confessed their sins way back during the year when they committed them. But on the Day of Atonement, there was special cleansing of the people. 
Now, you know the verse that uh, we all know well. 1 John 1, 9. Let's have a look at it again because I, I know you know it, but it's good to just look at it because sometimes we miss, because we memorize these verses, which is wonderfully good, um, and we can repeat them sometimes, and particularly this verse, probably without even thinking about it. But we need to think about it. It says here, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins, all right? So that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful truth. But what did the text go on to say as well? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, the cleansing is different to the forgiving. God does two things for us. He forgives us, then he wants to cleanse us, just like on the Day of Atonement. They confessed their sins during the year, but then they were cleansed on the Day of Atonement. Forgiveness and cleansing. Now, remember that verse that we spoke of yesterday in Ephesians? Maybe we ought to read it again because there may be folk here that weren't here yesterday. Just come uh, back to Ephesians, the third chapter, because this verse is such an important verse when it comes to understanding the whole plan of salvation. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church, to the principalities and powers, to the heavenly places. So the church, according to this verse, God wants their, us to make known to the universe, principalities and powers, the manifold wisdom of God. Obviously, up until that stage, the full manifestation and wisdom of God wasn't yet fully made known. And God wanted to use the church to continue to do that. That means when he said the church, who's that? Who does he want to use then? Not just the church in general. Who does that mean? That means you and it means me. God wants to use me and you to help the universe understand the manifold wisdom of God. It's a wonderful thought, isn't it, when you think about it. I think God would bother to use us. But the Bible says he is. And you can imagine one person bearing fruit brings glory to God, but imagine a whole group of people bearing fruit and bringing glory to God. And indeed on the Day of Atonement, the climax of that day was what God wanted to do for and through his people. Cleanse them of sin before an onlooking universe. And so there's a link between the judgment and holiness. A link between the judgment and holiness, cleansing. That's very, very clear when you read the type. And it's very clear when you read the antitype. Let me read it to you. Come over to, to the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, before Matthew. You'll come to Malachi chapter 3. And here is spoken some very interesting words. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Behold, sorry, I'm going too fast for you. Malachi 3. Verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. How do I know this is about the second coming? Well, let's read on, verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. 
He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. I was running some meetings once when I had a Catholic man come down to me and he said, do you believe in purgatory? I said, absolutely, I do. Oh, he said, someone told me that you didn't believe in purgatory. Well, I said, I don't know who that was, but he was wrong because I believe in purgatory and I hope you do too. What I didn't explain to him, because this was fairly early in the meetings, what I didn't explain to him at that stage, because you don't have to tell people everything about everything all at once. And I didn't tell him what I'm going to say to you now, and that is the difference between what the Catholic Church teaches about purgatory and what I believe about purgatory is when it happens. They believe it happens after you die, isn't that right? That's too late. It's got to happen before we die. That's what the Bible is talking about here. God wants to purge us. That's, that's the word purgatory. Purge us as silver and gold. He wants to refine us. Let's read on. Verse 4. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years, and I will come near you for judgment. So now the reference to the judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. So here the Bible says there's going to be a period of purging, of purifying, and this is what God is doing while the judgment is in progress. He is purging, purifying his people. And I notice in this verse just uh, what the church of Laodicea is. Remember the word Laodicea means God is my judge. And the last of those seven churches is dealing with the judgment. That's what Laodicea means, the time of judgment. And it's interesting in that message to the church of Laodicea part of it says that I will purge you as gold tried in the fire and remember he talks about eye salve and he talks about white raiment all the very imagery that we've been talking about this week all associated in the the time of the judgment And here the judgment is linked to purifying and cleansing God's people. God's people need to be cleansed as it was in the type during the period of the judgment on the day of atonement. In fact, it's interesting if you have a look at chapter 2 of Malachi, chapter 2, it um, gives a very interesting background as to why God has said what he has said in the third chapter of Malachi. There's a reason. And we notice that in chapter 2 and verse 17. Look. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, in what have we wearied you? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And he delights in them. Or where is the God of justice? What are these people saying? What, put, that, put what we've just read into today's language. When it says here, look, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. What's that mean? Uh, God's not going to be too particular. Don't worry about standards. You legalists. Don't worry about those things. What you eat and what you drink, what does that matter? That's got nothing to do with the kingdom of God. That's what they were saying back here. I just find it's, it's a credible that human nature doesn't change very much. And the same teachings that we are hearing today was prevalent back in Malachi's day. 
Oh, the Lord will overlook it. Don't worry about that. In fact, there's no such thing as a, as, as a judgment because where is justice? Where is the God of justice? See, exactly what I, I hear today talked. And here, and then Malachi goes on to say exactly what we read in chapter 3. The refiner's fire. God is very particular about what we believe and what we do. Not as a means of our salvation. Surely no one teaches that. We're not teaching that. But we're saying that when we're sanctified by faith, there's a big change in our life. Isn't that right? There's a big change in our lifestyle. There's a big change in what we eat and drink. You know, when we became Adventists, Vern referred to uh, that a few nights ago. When we became Adventists, we were meat eaters like everybody else. And uh, my father, I can still remember sitting down at the table and seeing the bottle of wine on the table. And um, we became convicted that the lifestyle that we were living is probably not the, the right one. So my mother went to church and someone down in the church told her about um, gluten steaks. <laughs> Boy. So she came home and made gluten steaks for us. I tell you, I've never forgotten those gluten steaks <laughs> because they were like rubber. You know, you chew, 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 chew and got nowhere. And they hadn't worked out to put some flavouring with it either. It was sort of a, a, a whitey colour, you know, the gluten steaks. And I think breadcrumbs was a bit of a foreign idea too at that stage. Because we were just learning. And uh, we, uh, even today, when I see gluten steaks even here, I remember that. And I don't eat them, even today. Put me off forever. And we were in earnest. We wanted to do the right thing. And God wants us to change our pattern, our life pattern. And that's what being an, a Seventh-day Adventist is all about. We ought to be different. We ought to dress differently. Isn't that right? Once upon a time, you could always tell a Seventh-day Adventist by when you met them, oh, they'd be Seventh-day Adventists, I, I can tell. I'm not so sure that you can always do that now because many of us want to look like the world. We want to get as close to the world as we can without being in the world. And God wants us to be different. We've got a message to bear. And he doesn't want us to be pale-faced either. He doesn't want us to look so thin that we look as like we need a good feed. You know, we've got to be sensible, but God wants us to represent him because we have a wonderful message to represent. Revelation 14. And one of our last verses, Revelation 14. This is a wonderful uh, chapter. We know it so well. But once again, I just want to draw your attention to a point. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, where it says very clearly in verse 6, Then I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Here is again linked lifestyle, actions, because what does it mean to give glory to God? What have we found? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, that they may... Glorify your Father which is in heaven. So glorifying God has a lot to do with the good works or the lifestyle in which we live. And the judgment comes right alongside it again because they're all tied in together. The judgment and lifestyle are linked together. 
And then it says in verse uh, 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And God identifies his, his people at the end of those three messages as those who are faithful to Jesus and also faithful to his commandments. And God is going to show that the accusations of the devil against you and against me when he says they are sinners is wrong because God is going to show him the books, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. That's why I can take him and her into heaven. That's why they can have eternal life because they have trusted in me. Revelation 3 verse 20. Last verse, Revelation 3 and verse 20. If you ever go over to England, to um, the church there, Christopher Wren's church, what's it called? St. Paul's, yes. The round one. And if you ever go there, if you walk, as you walk toward the altar, on the right-hand side as you walk down about halfway, as my memory serves me, Halfway, you've got a painting of this verse by Holman Hunt. Let's just read the verse. It's a beautiful painting, and I'm sure we've all seen it. Verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And we've all seen that picture of, of, uh, of Jesus knocking on the heart's door. A lot of uh, thistles and weeds growing up. No handle on the door because Holman Hunt was trying to teach us that we can only be opened by the inside because you and I have to open the door to Jesus to invite him to come in. And so he pictures Jesus knocking at the door. A beautiful picture of justification by faith. Beautiful picture. I don't think you could get a better one. It's just wonderful. Then when he is invited in, what does the next verse say? What does the next verse say? To him who what? Overcomes. Why does God link the two together like that? Because you can't have one without the other. It's a, it's a false gospel to only emphasize one side. The Bible always puts them together. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as also I overcame and sat down with my Father in heaven. God's appeal to us all today is to help to keep our understanding in balance. And that's why the sanctuary is such a wonderful study. And I trust that when we go home from our camp, that you will perhaps start to get the books down and start to read and do a little more study so that you become very acquainted with the sanctuary because you'll be thrilled the more you study, the more you'll learn. I tell you a good book, if you want to, and I'm sure Leanne will probably have it in the ABC. If she doesn't have it now, she can get it for you. It's called by Stephen Haskell, The Shadow of the Cross. And it's all about the sanctuary. It'll just makes everything come alive. It's beautifully written. What did I say? Sorry, uh, Ray. See why I need good men around me. Thank you, Ray. The shadow of the cross, right? The cross in its shadow. Well, it's still the shadow of the cross. Pointed forward, it's all right. Whichever way you like, She'll understand what you want. But it's a wonderful book, and uh, it will help you to understand it in, in ordinary language. You know what I mean? May God help us. It's a wonderful study, and as you do, you'll, you'll be lifted up into heavenly places and understand more and more of what Jesus wants us and not be misled when someone comes along with white teeth and seem to be persuasive on a subject that most people know very little about. That's why people like that have success, because most people don't know much about it. And because what they say seems to make sense, and it's said so nicely, 
people accept it. But you will not accept it if you study it for yourself and you understand the difference between truth and error. And uh, believe me, before we're through, God is, uh, the devil is going to make sure there are lots of other things that come along. The church is going to be buffeted. We've read that. We know that. And we need to be firm and true to what God has called us. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you again for blessing us as we have opened your word. We're always blessed when we study your word. Please help us. Help us to understand the type that you have given to us, the sanctuary. Such an important subject. You have said so much about it. And I pray, Lord, that as we continue to study, to make you the center of our life, that you will change us, that you will make us more and more what you want us to be. And as we spend that thoughtful time with you each day, sin will become hateful to us. To the sin, bless us now, as for the rest of this day and into tonight's meeting and tomorrow, I pray for Christ's sake. Amen.
天。